Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today we're starting with Contemporary Istanbul. The art fair has just kicked off and has a lot to offer with many new galleries, plus it's at a historical venue by the sea. But it doesn't last long, so for those who can't make it, I went there for you to check it out. Take a look. Tarsane Istanbul dates back to the 15th century and was once used by the Ottomans as an imperial shipyard. Today it's a cultural hub as it hosts the 18th edition of Contemporary Istanbul once again. This year's event features 67 galleries from 22 countries. And organizers hope it'll become a meeting point for collectors, artists and of course art lovers. First of all, we are 18 years old, yes, but at the same time, it's the 100th anniversary of the Turkish Republic. It's coinciding with eight, our 18 years, so that's more enthusiastic in a way. But this year, we're hosting 67 galleries. 21 of them are newcomers, forming for the first time to, to exhibit in here in Istanbul. So that's important. It's important because, you know, many of the galleries, all of the galleries, they try to attract new galleries at a certain level. Um, but this year it's, it's, it's uh, one almost one-third one third of the galleries. So uh, it brings new energy, new artists, new galleries, new relations to the fair. From sculptures to paintings, there are more than 1,500 artworks with a wide price range. Organizers say it's the most comprehensive display to date, with not only newcomers but also new sections such as CI Photo Focus. In our country, photography is less known compared to other plastic arts, other type of arts, a type of art. That's why we thought that there's a need for such a section in the fair. Gureli points out that there are many galleries from different countries such as Colombia, Mexico, Czech Republic and South Africa. Kalashnikov Gallery from Johannesburg is among those who are at this fair for the first time. I mean, we've spent a couple of days here now um, to kind of prepare us for this experience and we found quite a few similarities between Johannesburg and Istanbul. I think in terms of the energy um, and yeah, the different cultures um, and the way they mix um, is quite exciting, which feels very much like home. At AB Gallery from South Korea, we met Melek Anki. She is a half Turkish and half Taiwanese contemporary artist. And as she grew up in both countries, then moved to the US to study, she says she always searched for her true self other than just adapting to different cultures. So her artworks deal with individuation and authenticity while seeking a human connection. And her Hiramita character explores exactly all of these. Hiramita is actually a tile cat. In China, on the rooftops, they uh, put uh, sculptures to protect the house. Lions, dragons. Only one region they use cats. Uh, those small cats with their uh, fierce looks and big teeth uh, protect the house. So I used that um, character and created this modern character, a tile cat, who is not under the roof anymore, not alone. She wants to connect with us. She just wants to be herself, doesn't want to change to fit in. I think uh, currently our biggest problem in life is we want to fit in, we want to be accepted. Uh, but we also have so many different colors in life. Well, whether you want to meet artists and find out the stories behind their work, or enjoy a cup of coffee by the sea surrounded by artworks, Contemporary Istanbul is just for you. And it runs until October 1st. Esra Drust, TRT World, Istanbul. Rio de Janeiro presents Nova Biennale Rio, the city's first international biennial of art and technology. Housed in the Museum of Tomorrow, the event invites visitors to experience art with artificial intelligence. Robots with tentacles that react to human motions, radiant springs to explain quantum physics. The first edition of Nova Biennial Rio brings together nearly 70 works from 30 countries and celebrates the diversity of art and technology. 
Having become part of the state's cultural programming calendar, the biennial seeks to reconstruct the idea of the future and offers visitors a chance to touch, tour, and even merge into the works. This is a Quantum Jungle. This is my interactive art installation that consists of 720 metal springs that are all touch sensitive. And uh, in this installation, I visualize quantum particles, how they move. Um, and so when you touch these springs, you're actually creating a quantum particle. Uh, and it starts in this blue area where you touched, and then uses Schrodinger's equation to model the movement of the particles. Rather than a mere combination of art and technology, a blend between the artistic novelty and technological innovation forms the biennial's main concept. The biennial explores two themes, titled New Aesthetics and Super Creativity in the Era of Artificial Intelligence. The first treats visitors to vivid sensibilities and virtual ecosystems, while the other explores the ongoing collusion between human and AI-driven creativity. There are several prospects for the future, and one of them is art. Art will be something largely technological, because where is innovation and the new world taking place, it's within technology. That's why the concept of NOVA is the fusion between the new artistry and innovation. One may hope that NOVA Biennial Rio will build a secure position for tech art within Brazil. The Biennial runs until October 29th to propose a reflection on the societal changes that promote technologies in the heart of Rio de Janeiro. An exhibition in New York's Harlem is exploring art made by prisoners. It offers a peek into the psychological costs of the time spent behind bars and what the exhibit refers to as a system designed to disempower certain sections of the U.S. community. Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, tackles hyper-incarceration in the United States. The curator of the exhibit, Nicole Fleetwood, started the project as a way to process and grieve the incarceration of her loved ones. Some of them did not survive, and some are still serving time. So it's a system that reproduces inequality and that continues to impoverish and make vulnerable the lives of, of people who are already at the margins of society. So that's what, there, there's a critique of the system that, that's at the heart of the show. Um, and, it, and also I think art by incarcerated people really speaks for itself in terms of, uh, you know, claiming their presence in a society you know, kind of dominated by forms of punishment that is, that is meant to lock them out. The exhibit highlights how some parts of the country are specifically targeted. For me, I think it's important that we understand mass incarceration is not about the mass imprisonment of people equally across the country. It is the hyper-incarceration of specific populations in specific neighborhoods, like Harlem. A series of portraits of incarcerated men, 770 of them to be exact, is among the most striking works on display. Artist Mark Lafney spent most of his 10-year sentence drawing his fellow inmates. Well, because prison has a way of erasing people. The criminal justice system uh, locks people away and you don't really make a human connection to the people that are, so, are, in, are in prisons. And uh, if you look at these portraits, I mean, each face has a story. and um, You can focus on the individual and then pan out, and then you can focus on the greater story that's going on, and it's all just as important. Lafni hopes that visitors will take a sense of humanity from the people that serve time. He says the system is not concerned with correcting or betterment, and that it boils down to money. His mission now is to give voice to what he calls one of the most pressing issues in the U.S.
London's National Gallery has opened a retrospective of the 17th century Dutch painter Franz Hals. It's the largest exhibit devoted to Hals in 30 years. Here's more. Dutch painter Franz Hals' most famous work, The Laughing Cavalier, is the centerpiece of London's National Gallery's newest exhibition. It has left its home in the Wallace Collection for the first time since 1870s. Although the sitter is anonymous, his costume gives away quite a few clues. He is, he is he's one of those people that, we, that you feel that you have some sort of connection to when you, once you look at him. Um, partly because of his rather enigmatic smile, he's smiling rather than laughing, even though he's called the Laughing Cavalier. Laughing Cavalier is a sort of 19th century nickname. Um, the word Cavalier doesn't actually mean anything in this context. He's just a very well and opulently dressed man. Um, I would say probably a bachelor uh, on, on account of his very elaborate dress um, because married men would wear something more uh, you know, modest than that. Um, but we don't know who he is, uh, which is rather marvellous in a way that this famous picture is that we don't know who the sitter is. The painting dates back to 1624 and has mesmerised the art world with its depiction of an enigmatic smile. The sitter's stance is also significant. It, it's also a f famous example of this, what we like to call the Renaissance elbow, where you put your, um, your sort of a, an invention already, you know, 16th century Italian painters did it already, it's become known as the Renaissance elbow. Um, it is, um, but it is a very effective thing. It's both elegant and powerful. And, um, and it creates depth, of course. So the stance is, is, is makes, and you slightly look from, from below as well, which means that he sort of slightly towers, towers over you. Another piece that emphasizes Hulse's expertise is Banquet of the Offices of the St. George Civic Guard. It's a group portrait painted in Harlem in the Netherlands. The painting is owned by the city and on loan for the first time. And Frans Hals takes, really transforms that genre completely and makes sure that all these people actually interact with each other, that they uh, feel like they really belong together and that they look as if they are caught in a moment. Frans Hals is the artist who really knows how to, to create what we to, today would call a snapshot, even though, of course, that concept would not have been known to Frans Hals. The exhibition has also reunited two works that haven't been on display together since the 19th century. Portrait of Peter Dirks and Portrait of Mary Larb. Well, Franz Hals was a portrait painter extraordinaire, and what he specialised in was capturing those little moments, sort of a little side glance or a little smile coming across their face when they're having a convivial moment. And also, he was fantastic at capturing the magnificent facial hair that Dutchmen had in the 17th century with their immaculately waxed moustaches and beards. The retrospective runs from September 30th until January next year. Once the Regent's Park is transformed into an outdoor art gallery, Londoners know the Freeze Art Fair is just around the corner. This year's annual sculpture exhibition puts the spotlight on younger and lesser known artists. Free Sculpture features 21 installations in this edition. While this is the first time some of the artists are showcasing their work in public, for others it's a chance to show off their most ambitious pieces. Such as this one called The Mothership Connection by British Trinidadian artist Zach Ova. The work was actually commissioned to be in Haiti and it is an architectural spaceship, if, we, if you could say that. And each strand and each kind of like layer has a specific reference to Haitian masks or the top is the Mende masks of female spirit of healing. And, and in the internal layers you will see references to Masonic architecture or the kind of, let's say, the highbrow western architecture. Visitors can also wander beneath the trees and gaze at Holly Stevenson's The Debate, made of two ceramic ducks and an egg. 
From the front, it appears whole. That's until it's seen from the back. The symbol of the egg has been so prominent in art history, always represented fertility or transience of life. And, uh, and for her, it was like literally the kind of like the focus, the locus of subject matter of what she wanted to focus on. And funnily enough, there are two ducks that also live in Regent's Park. So there's kind of like a, you know, a conversation going on, I believe, after the closing hours. Artist Thomas Saraceno picked these tones to represent autumn and the cycle of decomposition of leaves. But there's more to explore at Freeze Sculpture that's warming up the city for the upcoming Freeze London and its sister fair Freeze Masters. Saudi Arabia's Ministry of Culture has hosted an exhibition that focuses on the cultural connection with its neighbor, Yemen. It celebrated what binds these two countries through music, art, traditional outfits and jewelry. The conflict between Saudi Arabia and Yemen has been the main story about the two countries since 2014. An exhibition about the common ground between the neighbors aims to shift that focus. It is a wonderful exhibition that reflects the extent of the connectedness between the Yemeni and Saudi cultures. There are many sections in the exhibition. There is a section displaying Yemeni musical instruments, a section showing traditional architecture from the two countries, a section for fashion and jewelry in the two countries, and a section displaying contemporary art. There are also sections displaying the creativity of youth in the two countries in general, whether in architecture or arts or artists playing musical instruments. Mohammed Sabah specializes in Yemeni fashion and jewelry and says there are some slight differences between the two countries, but also many similarities. I am responsible for the Yemeni fashion and jewelry section of the exhibition. I found that there is great similarity between Yemeni fashion and fashion in Saudi Arabia, as well as some slight differences in the embroidery. But in the end, we share one geography, one culture, and one civilization since the ancient times. Visitors from other countries were also impressed by the display. So what I thought of the exhibit, uh, I didn't think there'd be that much differences between Saudi and Yemen. They're bordering countries, so it makes sense that it might not be different. But then you see complete differences of the way they dress, the art, the architecture, or in the lay of the land. because. You think Saudi is a desert and Yemen will also be a desert, but then you see the mountainous regions and how it's like really different until you see it up in person. The immersive aspect of the exhibition was also enhanced with the backdrop of music from both countries. And whatever the occasion, putting aside conflict in favor of exploring cultures is always a welcome sight. owns cultural property and at what point does it become stolen? Well, a Dutch exhibit now uses virtual reality to show what would happen if all the looted artworks were returned to their rightful owners. Art has served in history as payment for troops, a way of humiliating the defeated or a display of power. Looted art refers to artworks that were stolen confiscated or forcibly sold during wars or colonial times. Many of them ended up in Europe in the 19th century, when museums first emerged. Housed by the Maritaus Museum in the Netherlands, Loot 10 Stories showcases 10 looted objects for a compelling account of plundered art. The exhibit features works from three periods, art looted by French revolutionaries in 1795, pieces taken by Nazis from Jewish owners, and artworks seized during the colonial era. Loot 10 Stories invites visitors to debate the past and future of stolen art through VR technology. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because there's the, there's the question of technical challenge, right? And then there's also the question of uh, storytelling challenge and how, actually, how do you want to tell stories with these new mediums? In an odd way with VR, the question is, can you even really tell a story with VR? That's why we made a very deliberate choice with these experiences to essentially drop people into history 
it's not particularly narrative, you're essentially arriving back at a time that you would not have access to, like you stepped into a time machine. Rembrandt's self-portrait from 1669 is one of the artworks which can be seen in VR. The painting belonged to a Jewish family but was stolen by Nazis during World War II. The exhibit aims to prompt visitors to consider how these objects were looted and what would have happened if they were left undisturbed. I think it's very painful to see all those uh, cultural objects uh, in the depots of our European museums because we know that the people uh, to whom they belonged are deprived of their culture. Um, so yes, I think it's, uh, it, it is painful indeed, but I'm also thankful to the fact that our museums work quite hard nowadays, finally, on the restitution of those objects as well. Loot 10 Stories runs through January 7, 2024 to explore the questionable museum acquisitions and make the contested histories of stolen artworks visible. Japanese filmmaker Yasujiro Ozu is a national treasure in his homeland. On the international front, his films are considered among the gems of world cinema and perhaps none more so than Tokyo's story. In our movie Amanak, Alijan explains how the film not only touched audiences from different cultures, but also became a symbol of Japan's soft power in the post-war world. In Tokyo's story, an elderly couple leave their village to visit their children in the city. But it seems the grown-up kids don't have the time to spend with their parents. And it's the couple's widowed daughter-in-law who spares the time to be with them. Tokyo Story is an examination of family values. It also shows what kind of effect city life could have on that. The movie is considered director Yasujiro Ozu's masterpiece, both for its subject matter and the way it's filmed with a calm style, made up of static shots. But other than its cinematic merits, the feature also has another thing going for itself. Scholars say it became a representation of Japan's soft power in the post-war world, which helped the country build bridges with the West in the 1950s and seek diplomatic relations on all fronts. Critics point out that with his calm style, universal themes, and what they call the humanism of Tokyo Story, Ozu filmed to that vision. <laughs> That is global politics. On the movie buffs front, it's still considered a world classic that due to its subject matter, that still retains its relevance. Well, that's it for this episode of Showcase. I'm Esra Durust from me and the whole team here in Istanbul. Thanks so much for watching and bye for now.